Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar with cybersecurity expert Derek A. Smith in 12 strategies for getting your password game in check. It's going to be a good one today, you guys. You're also joined by Beyond Trust product manager Martin Kennard, who will run us through a brief introduction of Beyond Trust Power Broker Password Safe after Der Derek's presentation. So please stick around for that. My name is Sarah, your webinar host today. I'd like to remind you to please submit your questions via the chat box in the GoToMeeting console anytime throughout the webinar, and we'll cover your questions at the end during our Q&A time. So pop on your questions in. I'll be monitoring those throughout. Also, today's session is being recorded, and all attendees will receive a link to the recording and the slides within one to two business days from now. So at this point, I'd like to hand it on over to Derek. We'll jump right in. Hello, Derek. Welcome to the line. I know you have a lot to cover, so please take it away. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Everybody, thank you for being here today and sharing my birthday with me today. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sarah, forgive me, I got to do this. I hope everybody can see it, can hear it. All right. <laughs> so it's that time, folks. Let's go ahead and get started. So today's my birthday. So again, thanks for sharing it with me. I'm going to talk about 12 strategies for getting your password game in check today. All right, I'm gonna give you some um, some things that I really wanna talk about, I wanna share with you about how to make sure you have a strong password pro um, program or system within your organization, okay? Now, before I do that, I wanna talk about a few things, okay? The thing is that controlling your access management is the most critical defense that you can leverage against hackers today. Every day I hear something in the news about someone's passwords getting cracked or, you know, a, court, a company losing information due to passwords or whatever. The thing is, access management is the first line of defense. If they can't get into your system in the first place, guess what? They can't steal your stuff. But unfortunately, passwords are probably the weakest, the weakest link that we have in that system. Okay. A lot of organizations like yours is faced with hurdles in effectively trying to rein in control of your privileged access accounts or your privileged accounts and your passwords. And thus, after, uh, hackers, what they're doing is they're out there continually looking to pounce on this weak point that's out there, trying to find ways to get access to your passwords so they can get into your systems and take advantage of whatever they can take advantage of. Now, there's another part to this whole thing that I'm talking about here. So another critical issue is that our organizations commonly rely too um, heavily on a lot of different applications to fulfill a lot of different um, business needs that we might have out there. Now, this is especially true for those smaller companies that might happen to be listening. If you have a small company, small business, why? Because you can't afford all the big um, access management tools that might be out there. Okay. So here with a smaller company, your access management tends to be distributed across a lot of different business units or maybe system owners. If you're a large company, that model does not allow for you to have a functional password management program, meaning it's pretty much impossible for you to manage your user access and manage your privilege levels and revocation of your passwords and things like that. So we're going to talk about that as we go on today. Now, for those of you who don't know me yet, uh, again, I'm Derek Smith, and I do a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I'm a board advisor on a couple of college and university boards and, and some other boards. Um, I'm an advisor for, um, for, for Washington Center for Cybersecurity Research and Development. I just started my own center. It's the National Cybersecurity um, Education Center, where I'm providing education like this to folks who need it around cybersecurity. I'm a college professor at the University of Maryland and a couple of other colleges, University of Baltimore, Maryland, Baltimore County, and Virginia University of Science and Technology. So I teach this stuff on a, on a regular basis. I've written a few books on it, um, CyberSense, which is a leader's guide to to protect your critical infrastructure, understanding in layman's term how to protect your systems in your organization. Now, I work for the government. I'm a government IT program manager at, don't run away, I'm at the IRS, okay? So as they say, you don't mess with the IRS. And I own a little small training company as well. So I just wanted you to get to know me just a little bit before I get started. So let's look at some troubling trends that's out there around this whole cybersecurity thing and passwords in general and what we're doing with it. 
So I went out and I read a bunch of, re, um, of surveys when I was getting ready for this webinar. And basically, they all kind of said the same thing. Forrester did a report that estimated that about 80% of your security breaches involve theft of your privileged credentials. Your passwords, pretty much, is what they're saying. Um, there was a breach, if you all remember, of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, or OPM. And the hackers got in, they stole credentials of a trusted contractor. Does that, does that kind of sound familiar? Does that bring back memories of um, Target and how um, a trusted contractor was used to get into the system? Remember, you're only as strong as the, your weakest link, and that might be that contract at this point. But anyway, with OPM, there was leaks of um, 21.5 million individuals' information was out there. Okay, Now, what did it do? Um, as far as OPM's um, credibility and things like that, it kind of hurt their credibilities. Okay? Not only that, it helped folks like me and folks who are in this industry because they awarded a contract for more than $133 million for identity theft protection services alone. So this thing costs us money. This thing costs us time. It costs um, individuals money when they lose their information. You can see it's a very serious thing that we're dealing with. Some more statistics here. Another survey found that 20% of organizations have never changed default passwords on a privileged account. Now, 20% is not many. You know, that means 80% of them did. But how is this even happening in this day and age? You know, if you you, um, you want to go back and make sure that you're changing those passwords, that you're taking care of those types of things. 30% um, of organizations still allow accounts and passwords to be shared among each other, among their employees. 40% of organizations use the same security for privileged accounts as they do for their standard accounts. 70% of organizations do not require approvals for creating new privileged accounts. And 50% of organizations do not audit privileged accounts. Uh, I want to take a, look, a quick look at the LinkedIn br breach. Now, let me tell you this. I love LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn every day. I've met thousands of people and got lots of work, um, consulting work and things like that on LinkedIn. Um, but unfortunately, in 2012, they lost 167 million account credentials in a data breach. A hacker, um, his name was Peace. A uh, Russian hacker named Peace, he stole 6.5 million encrypted passwords from the site and then he posted them on a Russian crime forum. Okay, um, when he went in, one person, well, Peace was selling 117 million email and password combinations on a dark web, web marketplace, and the going rate for these was $2,300 for each one of them. Now, there was a, there's a news source out there, uh, it's called Leak Source. they're a paid search engine for hacked data claims. They went out and they acquired 160 million, um, 67 million of those login credentials. And then they verified that at least one of the hack accounts was legitimate by confirming the details from um, one of the victims of those accounts. Another guy, a cybersecurity researcher, he went out and confirmed details on two more of the victims. All right. So um, Corey Scott, which is LinkedIn's chief information security officer, he came out and he published a post on their website. So we know that this really happened. And he addressed this incident on their official um, blog, on LinkedIn's official blog. And I'm going to quote what he said. He said, yesterday, we became aware of an additional set of data that had been released, um, been released that claims to be email and hash password combinations of more than 100 million LinkedIn members from that same theft in 2012. He mentioned that the company had required all accounts they believed to be compromised be reset for passwords in 2012, okay? And, and then recommend all other users reset their passwords also. And you know what, come to think of it, I don't recall resetting my account. So guess what I'm gonna be doing after this, uh, after this webinar? But anyway, that's the leaked in. I wanted to kind of bring home, uh, you know, the, the immenseness of this problem that we deal with. I have other statistics. Three out of 10 organizations allow accounts to be shared. I talked about that. Four out of 10 companies use same security for privileged accounts and so on and so forth. I'm not going through all those. But I want to ask this question. What are these people thinking? You know, now we hear about all these breaches and all these problems, but at least 40 percent of businesses still haven't implemented some type of privileged access management program. They still try to do things the old fashioned way, trying to do things manually, you know, or use stuff that, that comes with the software. Hey, this is not working, people. This isn't working. We have to do better than this. And today I want to talk to you about how to do better. OK. Now, we should be paying attention to this. You would think that those folks out there um, would spend more time trying to implement some type of um, uh, uh, 
access management, a password uh, uh, management system, whatever that type may be, whatever you all choose to use. Because there's some key business drivers like these I have on the slide that's telling us that we need to be doing this. Okay. First of all, all of us probably have to adhere to, adhere to some type of regulatory compliance, Sarbanes, Oxley, PCI, whatever it may be. You know, we have auditing reporting requirements. You know, we have control requirements that they put forth. If you're in the HIPAA industry, if you're in the medical industry and use HIPAA, they have controls that have to be out there. So we should be paying attention to our password just based on that. Don't we want to be proactive in our information security practices? We want to make sure we don't have loss and, and risk in our organization. We want to make sure we get a good return on investment on anything we're buying to put in place to try to fix these things and just return on investment on our business in general. And we want to be able to have some type of good password management out there. We don't want breaches. Do any of you on this call want to be um, subject, uh, be the, the, the person, the reason that a breach happened? I think, um, I can't remember the organization, that big breach that happened not too long ago. Um, what was it? Is it the, the Experian or whatever? I, anyway, whatever it was, the CEO just resigned yesterday, I, I read. So, you know, do you want to be the person responsible for that? Do you want to be resigning because you're the CISO or you're the system engineer that's in charge of, of um, security or losing your business over this? You know, so these are the things that we've got to be cognizant of. These are the things that's driving us to have to go out and pay more attention to these type of issues. Now, what's the problem? Why is this still happening? This is 2017. I've been talking about this for a long time. A lot of people have been talking about this for a long time. So why is this still happening? I'm going to tell you why it's still happening. The thing is, I think that it's, um, you know, we, we say it's a high priority, right? We say that we need to be doing these things, but we have low, we display low compliance in doing so, okay? And there's a lot of reasons out there. Here's some of mine on the slide. First, it says, and I'm going back to surveys I've read, 80% of respondents of the survey indicated that um, that PAM security is a high priority for the organization, like I said. 60% said PAM security is required to demonstrate compliance with government regulations. But listen to this. 52% of the participants received a failing grade on enforcement of proper privilege credential controls. They know it has to be done. They know the importance of it, but they're not doing it. Why aren't they doing it? Okay? They have a lot of reasons out here. Some of it is a lack of awareness of privilege account abuse. Uh, prioritization of conflicting security initiatives. We only have so much money out there, people, right? So we have to see where we're going to put that money. But I'm telling you, again, access management should be where we put in our resources because, um, because that's where a lot of this is happening. Don't let them in the door in the first place. Second place, and this is on my bandwagon, the second place we should be looking is inside a threat. And so we want to put some money there. But where are we putting the money? And just as an aside, I'm going to pitch myself just for a second. But if any of you are going to be at InfoSec North America ne um, next week, I'm going to be speaking on the inside of threat um, at that event. So if you're there, please come out and see me. All right, back to this. Um, cost. Cost is another deciding factor. The price tag of PAM implementation can be a major investment. Now, I think it's a worthwhile investment. I think there's something that you should be doing. But, um, but, it, but know that it's going to be a cost. And then relative immaturity of some organizations' cybersecurity practices and programs. The thing is that not everybody is a very, very large company that can spend millions of dollars on cybersecurity. Some of them are smaller companies, and therefore they have to look at where their dollars are going, you know, and, and, um, and, then, and their programs are not as mature. So, you know, that's, that's going to be a factor in how they're going to deploy the resources, the limited resources that we have. Think about this, a small doctor's office, a small legal office. They do not have the resources to have maybe even a full-time cybersecurity staff on location. You find their system administrator is also their security guru. And I'm going to be honest with you, if you're a system administrator, forgive me for this, but you're not a security expert. We spend our time, we spend our energy learning more and more about security issues. And you spend your time and energy making sure that that system is up and running. All right. So that's not your main focus, unless it's a hobby of yours. There's another reason why it's happening also, and that's lack of proper action on privilege accounts. So even if for those who are taking some action, many are not taking the right action. Practice does not make perfect people. Practicing the right way makes perfect. So many businesses do not manage their privileged accounts with the same rigor as they do their human user accounts. 
You know, the privilege um, account passwords are often not regularly changed, may be stored in unsecure files on devices like laptops where the bad guys can get their hands on them and use these things. Privilege accounts are often shared among many IT users. That's going to be a lack of accountability. That means that compromise of one set of privilege account credentials can open doors to other credentials and other systems being compromised. A lot of organizations grant third party vendors. We just read about a third party vendor being the cause of a big data breach, right? That cost somebody $133 million. So vendors uh, like uh, vendors and contractors and things like that, people in your supply chain, they can be detrimental to your security and your organization. There's a lot of reasons. We just got to do it the right way. There's a lot of ways to fix it. We got to do it the right way. Um, I'm taking a step back here just to talk about the different types of privilege account. Most of you probably know what they are, but it's always good for me to level set and make sure that we're on the same page. So there's primarily three types of accounts that are, that are out there. You have your administrative accounts, and those are things like your shared accounts, your Unix uh, root accounts, your um, database administration accounts, your Windows domain accounts. You have your shared accounts, like your help desk accounts, you know, your operate your emergency operation accounts, like your break fix accounts or whatever they may be, developer accounts, those are shared accounts. Um, accounts that are owned by the system. You have your application accounts in the second category, the second swim lane you hear, you see here. These are hard coded and embedded passwords that you have. You know, they have generic IDs, they run your batch jobs and your application IDs. Or you have your service accounts, your Windows service accounts, your scheduled task accounts. And the last type we have, uh, I'm sorry, folks, are our personal computer accounts. The accounts on our desktops and laptops and other devices that we have in our organizations. So these are the type of privileged accounts, just to give you a, a, a quick familiarity of what type of accounts that I'm talking about. Now, let me take a look at um, some of the, the common practices and problems that I see around these accounts and the password practices in general that's out there today. So common practices are for us to use these accounts for things like storage, when we store in Excel spreadsheets, or even our combinations for our physical safes. You know, we, we put uh, passwords down on, on sticky notes. Um, you know, we try to memorize them, which is kind of difficult when you have a bunch of them. We even hard code them into applications and services, which can be a bad thing for us as well. Common practice is using for resets, usually by some type of I, memory of your IT department, help desk or your call centers and things like that. These passwords are known to your IT staff, your network operations staff, your help desk staff, your developers, and a lot of other people out there. So come, some of the common problems you get from that is that they're widely known and sometimes there's no accountability. When an IT staff go out and use the account and something happened, I can't track it back to him. I don't know who did it. I don't know. But who had last access? There's often unchanged passwords out there that's being used. There's lost passwords that get into the wrong hands and then they're being utilized to, to exploit our systems. You know, same passwords being passed across multiple systems or used on multiple systems. I'm guilty of this. How many of you all use the same password on multiple systems? I use them at home, I use them at work because it's hard for me to remember 12, 13, 14, 50 passwords and passphrases. So I duplicate a lot of stuff. I'm a cybersecurity expert, and I still find myself doing some of the bad behavior that I always talk about we should not do because we're human, <laughs> and we, we take shortcuts sometimes. Okay? Um, simplistic passwords that are easy to remember. Let me tell you this. If it can fit in a dictionary, if it can be found in a dictionary, you probably shouldn't be using a password because somebody can attack it. I'll talk about that later. And password is not available when we need it because guess why I left that piece of paper that I wrote it on in my office. And I'm working from home today. All right. So these are some of the common practices and problems that I see. Now, what I did is that I promised you that I would give you trail strategies to protect your passwords for unauthorized users. I want to get you. I want you to get your password game on. And I want to make sure that you're doing the right things when it comes to your password. So I'm going to give you these 12 strategies that I recommend that I hope that are going to be helpful to you when you start putting together your own password strategy. And the first one I have here is that I want you to implement and adopt security policies. I put this first in everything because everything starts with good security policies, good practices. OK, good practices start with those good policies. Let me tell you something that I always tell folks when I'm um, consulting and things that 
um, anything you do in cybersecurity, anything you do in IT, we're only there to have to do one thing. You know, we're you know nowadays cybersecurity, we, we used to be the stepchildren. Now we're the heroes, and we drive a lot of things that happen in the business. Right? It shouldn't be that way. Cybersecurity should be an enabler. We should help people to make um, the mission go better. Okay. So the first thing we we want to make sure we do is that everything we spend money on in cybersecurity and IT should only enhance uh, and enforce our security policies. We shouldn't be buying things because that's the coolest toy out there or that's the newest thing out there if it doesn't go to the bottom line, which is helping once again to enforce um, our security policies, to enforce the to enhance the mission of our organization. Okay. So I recommend that you adopt and implement security policies that ensure certain things. And the main thing I wanted to ensure is a least privileged strategy for accessing those accounts. And if you remember, what does a least strategy mean? That means I only have the ability to do the things um, that are necessary in my job to get my job done. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay? Least privileged policy, again, is what I'm looking for. The second thing is I want to limit admin access to my systems. Again, I told you that your administrators can do a lot of things within your system. They, they, they have a lot of power when they have an administrative account. Um, so you have to be cognizant of that. You have to be aware of the things that's being done by those system administrators. So organizations should adapt, again, that least privileged strategy that I spoke of. I want you to perhaps consider enforcing least privilege on your end user workstations, as it says here, by keeping end users configured to a standard user profile. You know, they can only do certain things with that standard user profile. And then we can automatically elevate their privilege to run only approved and trusted applications. And they can't add other things onto your system that they're not supposed to add there. Now, with your IT administrators, your sysadmins, they should only make use of their privilege accounts when it's absolutely necessary. When it's not necessary, they should not be using that privilege account. They should be using their user account to get other things done. Number three, I want you to protect those privilege account passwords. Okay, so uh, um, the, the the thing is here, it, it's critical for me to manage, to monitor, and control my privilege account access. I need to know who exactly is in my account and exactly what it is they're doing. Now, these accounts are necessary for me to do my job, you know, securely manage my, my critical infrastructure and my, my, my organization in general. But a lot of companies begin the process of securing their privileged uh, passwords by, um, by, you know, by, by basically just letting the, the IT administrator do whatever he, it is he needs to do. They assign his password to them. They assign these accounts to them, and then they allow them to kind of run free on it. We don't want to do that. We want to be able to to rein them in, and we want to be able to protect those passwords that's out there and not share all those passwords uh, and let them get out and get around to folks who should not have them. Okay. Um, there's, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. So your your privilege accounts that's used by your system administrators, they allow them to modify your, your system data and your files and perform special applications and database functions and create user accounts and all that powerful stuff that they can do. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I work for the federal government, and given the increased government scrutiny I have, and for you in industry, the increased industry um, scrutiny out there on data protection, the need for um, effective security measures that meet regulatory requirements and protect our privileged account information is needed now more than ever. We need to be diligent about this. Okay. So again, um, making sure people have the minimum requirements, making sure those passwords are protected, um, those are going to be helpful for us and protect us for any kind of security threat that might be out there. Let's go to number four. I need you to inventory your privileged accounts. Your privileged passwords um, or, or your privileged accounts are going to be hard to protect if you don't know what are, what's out there and what exists. I'm just give you an analogy. One time I was doing an um, a, a NMAP. I was trying to find <clears throat> all the servers and things like that connected to, this was doing DOD, doing the military time. I was trying to find servers and everything, all the components attached to a certain network. You know, and I ran an MMAP, and I found old modems that no one talked. We still had modems. They were talking about modems out there, and modem age had passed. We had all these things that could be role access points that we did not know about. How could we protect them if we didn't know about them? 
So there are tools out there for both Windows and Unix environments that's going to help you discover where your privileged accounts are located across your, your entire enterprise environment. You need to find those and therefore find the passwords and therefore be able to protect those accounts that are out there and you know and get your hands on them. Now, there are a lot of different accounts and it's important to note that those privileged passwords can be sitting in a lot of different places. I'm going to give you an example of just a few of those. Your administrative accounts that are shared by multiple IT professionals, IP users, IT users out there and come predefined by your manufacturer including your Unix root accounts and your Cisco enabled accounts and your Windows administrator accounts, those are out there. You have your general shared administrative account, like those found in applications that's used by, let's say, your IT help desk and your operations department, um, you know, or your fire call activities and things like that. those are out there. I mentioned those hard coded. You have hard coded and embedded application accounts, like your resource database IDs and your generic IDs and your batch job IDs and all that. If you're a tester, your testing scripts, those are out there. And then, of course, those personal computer accounts we had, like our Windows local administrative account on our laptops and our desk accounts. So it's important creating that inventory of privileged passwords and, and, and the users that's responsible for managing those is going to enable me, it's going to be enable you to go back and identify which IT systems or which IT assets are more vulnerable to, um, to external data security threats and, and even internal data, data security threats. So we need to be cognizant of that. And I'm going to give you another tip, too. In addition to that, that list can be used as a checklist when you go out and try to determine whether your privileged passwords are properly protected and, and try to follow some type of established change management process that I'm going to talk about in just a little while as one of my 12 strategies. Strategy number five, ensure that an individual and not a generic user is accountable for the privileged account. So again, I told you somebody need to be, we need to be able to track back to somebody, right? When it comes to managing those privileged accounts, a, a common error that I make, that you all make, that everybody make that I'm looking at is to import all the administrator or their shared ideas into a system that's built for managing user accounts associated with a person, like um, such as your privileged password management system or something like that. Now, the benefit of doing that is that your organization or you you can quickly and automatically update your privileged passwords by searching for them in one location right it's centralized easy to find well let me tell you something unfortunately those kind of systems don't allow you to identify who's responsible for remaining for i'm not remaining but for maintaining that password for example um if i got an activity report that activity report can show that an administrator um identity downloaded a database um, from my company client list, let's say my top company client list, and it can show it happened today. What time is it? It can show it happened today at 1:30 on Thursday, September 28th, 2017, which is right now. But due to lack of specific user information residing in that system, I am not able to go back and identify the specific individual who performed that activity. So I don't know who went and looked at that list and and what they did with that information that they saw on that list. So if I want to go back and, and try to deliver true accountability, um, my system, my tracking system have to tie to an individual and I have to tie that individual to, um, well, I have to be able to track what that individual is doing. And I have to be able to go back and talk to that individual. And if I have to do an audit, my audit needs to be able to show me what that person was doing. Number six, I want you to securely store your privileged accounts. So, you know, this might sound obvious to you, all right? <laughs> Derek, I'm going to store my passwords. But it's imperative that, uh, that you store your privileged passwords in the most secure vaulting system that's available out there. Out there. And, and by the way, this is a system that's going to provide you multiple security layers, like the use of, um, uh, of file access control and encryption and authentication and firewalls to to try to hide or try to protect your passwords okay you know storing passwords in seal envelopes or lock binders you know encrypted files that can be easily decrypted you know things like that that's not an acceptable alternative to having good password vaulting <coughs> excuse me next i want you to develop and use a stage approach for deployment okay so your privileged pa passwords are literally I hate to say this all, all you know, because this is kind of a cliche now, but they're literally, literally the keys to the kingdom. They're the keys that's going to open the door to your sensitive company information. Or if you're listening listen to me from home, your sensitive home information. Okay. 
which is why they have to be securely um, stored. They have to be properly stored. Okay. Now, one common stumbling block that I run into around privileged passwords is that once that password inventory that I talk about, you should have once that's created, that the sheer volume um, of that becomes overwhelming to the person that's trying to maintain it. So what happens is that as a result of that, IT personnel might be tempted into thinking that if they never secured this information before, why should I bother doing it now? You know, nothing has happened. So why should I worry about trying to secure this now? And when you have situations like that, your internal auditors, if you have internal auditors or if you bring a team in to do it for you, they need to work with your IT department to try to put together a plan that's going to ensure that your privileged your privilege passwords are not lost or not mismanaged in some kind of way, especially if you're government or even if you're a private company and you want to make sure that you're staying safe. And that plan that they come up with, it needs to be a step-by-step -step process that you can use to secure your privileged account information with some reasonable deadlines and some deliverable. And here's what's important, folks. How about some consequences for people who don't comply with it? Okay. The reason I have rules, regulations, and policies is for one thing, and that's for if somebody doesn't comply with those rules and policies and regulations, with, there's some kind of consequence. Without consequence, why would I even adhere to it? Why would I even follow, hey, I, I'm supposed to change my password every 30 days, but so what? What are they going to do if I don't do it? All right, so there has to be some consequence there as well. So I need that stage um, approach. I need a, a clear, definitive uh, approach to doing this stuff. Next, I talked about embedded passwords a little while ago, um, pre, pre, um, pre, um, I can't think of the word I'm trying to find, but there, there are already um, programs into the application. All right, so according to one study out there, it says that although 99% of organizations have policies in place that mandate employees to change their personal passwords, up to 42% of IT departments never change hard-coded or embedded passwords for applications. Sorry, I was reading that. So for the application IDs, for the application testing scripts, for your batch jobs and stuff like that, people aren't, aren't changing those passwords. And what that does is this creates an application-to-application -application password problem that's going to be exponential for us. It's going to be a big problem for us. And let me give you an example. So if you had a company or your organization has 300 hosts, with two applications in each host, and each application has five scripts. And this translates into a total of 3,000 shared, uh, not shared, but 3,000 embedded passwords, 3,000 stored embedded passwords that you have to deal with. Now, because those passwords are often stored in, or I shouldn't say stored, but often in clear text, and they're available to your developers and your database administrators and things like that, your, your password protection pro system or program is not going to be able to protect each password. So as a result, what happens? Auditors come in. Uh, well, I won't say they come in, but I'm going to say this. You or your auditors need to recommend that change management policies clearly mandate the need to update those hard-coded passwords, okay, to outline specific steps for changing them and maintaining them and storing those passwords. That's going to be very important to you. Number nine is that I need you to educate your key stakeholders. You know, the boss needs to be compliant too, you all. If you don't get it from the top down, then your employees are not going to see the importance of it, and they're not going to be worried about it either. Your stakeholders need to understand why privileged account and access management security is urgent and is essential, right? I got to take, um, well, I have a, I, I'll supply this later so you can post it, but there's a password vulnerability benchmark that you're going to look at to see if your organization stacks up against similar organizations out there, or you can Google this. Also, I'm going to give you a checklist at the end, so bear with me. Um, you need to provide greater visibility into your, um, your program. Now, I see a lot of people try to do a manual or they try to use a lot of different applications to try to protect passwords. <clears throat> the best thing you can do is automate your um, privilege access management solutions. That's going to give you greater visibility into your environment. You're going to be able to get good reports. You're going to be able to see what's working and not working. You're going to be able to do a lot of things that's going to allow you to make sure that you do this thing right, Okay, that you take time to implement the right tools and the right things. All right, and the biggest thing with this also is that it's going to help you demonstrate that you're complying with the rules and regulations and audits that you um, are mandated to comply with. 
this is something you definitely want to look into, something you definitely want to do. And I have a bonus for you. I told you it's 12 strategies, but I always like to over deliver. So here's a bonus for you. <laughs> um, um, automate management and security of those privileged account passwords as well. Okay. Again, it's extremely difficult to stay on top of the management of those privileged accounts using those manual processes. Okay. Again, there are affordable PAM solutions available for organizations of any size. Okay. So that kind of is additional to what I just said. Automate all your privilege access management processes, but also make sure you automate security of your privilege passwords as well as part of doing that. So those are your 12 strategies. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I cheated myself. <laughs> All right. Uh, I told you I was going to make sure that I talk about change management policy. So here's the real bonus. Okay. But um, change ma management, you have to apply and enforce change management policies to your privilege passwords. You want to make sure. Now, again, this sounds obvious also. Okay. But it's, it's surprising how often privileged password policy, uh, policies don't talk about the change management process. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're looking at the change management process as well. It says here to ensure privilege passwords are updated frequently, ID departments need to keep accurate and updated records of all privilege password event inventories, as I told you, as well as create, implement, and enforce a change management policy that identifies the rules for creating passwords, how often those passwords need to be changed, where they're going to be stored, and who's going to be have access to that inventory list. Who's going to be? Who am I going to look to when I need to find out what's going on? with my different um, passwords and password processes and everything else that I have in, um, in my organization. And now here's the real bonus. This is something I put in bonus because this is something that people are reluctant to do. We, we, we collect a lot of data, we collect a lot of metrics and statistics, but then we don't go back and look at them. What good is it to collect all this stuff and then we don't go back and look at them and use that stuff to make positive changes in our organizations? So I need you to complete audits, but not just complete them. I need you to go back and I need you to look at them. These audit reports uh, of privileged accounts are essential in helping your organization manage your, your sensitive data effectively. It's going to show you what's wrong. It's going to show you what's being done um, inefficiently. So they, go, they should be able to go out and identify when your privileged passwords are updated. It should be able to identify any update failures, you know, the access history of particular identities or passwords that you have in there. You know, what's very important is what did those people perform when they were using that account, especially if it's a shared account, okay? Doing this, again, is going to uh, enable your internal auditors or people you have coming into your organization to understand the state of your organization's password management activities and provide recommendations that's going to help me deter security breaches, going to help me do things better, hopefully stop them from um, occurring or reoccurring in the future if you've already had one. Now, um, one of the steps that I talked about a little while ago, and I think is very important for you, is for you to automate your password management process. And that's going to give you centralized control over your passwords, over your password system, your access management in general. So by combining security techniques with best security practices, these 12 things that I just told you about, it's going to be possible for you to outline the specific security requirements that you need for a centralized password system or a system, centralized password management system. And here are some of them. You know, you're going to have central server authentication, one server, client agent authentication. Protected central repository for storing all your password. Um, you're going to have encryption over your sessions and your message level encryption. You're going to have, it's going to be tamper resistant. Um, you have libraries and applications, server scope control, secure local caching, protected key materials. A lot of protection comes from that centralized management system. And in order to achieve those security requirements that I just named in that list, and you can go back and look at that later. You're going to have some security building blocks that you got to put in place that's going to prove the, um, to be effective for your program. Let me talk about those real quick, and I'll get, get done with you. You want to have integrity verification. And when I use integrity verification, that centralized password management is going to determine, um, as I said, that the calling application, the password management system, all remain as originally developed and deployed. It hasn't been changed. It hasn't been altered in some kind of way. So what we're doing is we have verification techni techniques, okay? And they're going to go in and check the integrity of our system, the integrity of our central password management system, 
Okay, and they're gonna check applications and and make sure that they're secure before they even release credentials to those systems. You want to be able to have validated cryptography in your system. Okay, password encryption keys have to be protected from unauthorized disclosure and validated. You know, we want to have validated cryptographic programs that's protecting us this way. At the bottom, it says you want to have assured protection from any possible unauthorized disclosure and validated cryptography will help you with that. Fingerprinting. So your service print fingerprint says a unique biometric element produced from a combination of hardware characteristics like your serial numbers, your network IDs and all that. So by registering all requesters to your system, that fingerprint has become a critical factor in controlling um, the scope of authenticating servers when you're in your system. Again, this is centralized, um, centralized control. Transformation. Code transformation, they're mathematical alterations that are applied to your data flow and control flow within your program to high information algorithms. It says the technique, this technique prevents reverse engineering and create interdependencies and complexity that prevent tampering of your system. Just a couple more. Renewability, I think is the last one. Okay. This technique is going to contribute to your overall effectiveness and security of your password management solution. What does it do? It limits the lifetime of critical elements of the system. Um, by doing a, a, a bunch of different things, I have it on another slide that you can look at, but basically it's going to shorten the amount of time that your attacker has to successfully breach the component before it's being replaced, before your security mechanisms kick in. And it talks about those on the renewability or how you can use it for passwords and, and repository encryption and all that here, but I'm not going to cover that for time's sake. I want to jump ahead and say that if you take my recommendation and you decide to use some type of privileged account management system, there's certain things I think you should look for. And you can just look at this checklist. Make sure that um, that this, that the, it's exceptionally secure solution for the keys of the kingdom. Basically, it's a good solution. It Don't go out and just get something free, download something free from the internet, or get something out that is not proven. You want something that's going to be exceptionally secure for making sure that your keys to the kingdom does not get out. You want to make sure that it has supreme performance availability, disaster recovery capabilities, things like that. You want to make sure that it's flexible, it's flexible distributed architecture that's going to fit your architecture um, needs, your topology that you already have in place. You want to have a single standard solution that will also deal with multifaceted problems. And you want to make sure that it's intuitive and it has re robust interfaces. Because guess what? You don't want to go out and buy a lot of new stuff and have to change everything. This thing should be able to to um, I can't think of the word but integrate integrate with things that you already have in place. And why should you do this? Because Pam can provide a centralized methodology to integrate security controls across your perimeter, your network, and your application security zones. A Pam system can also help your business manage privileged sessions. That Pam system can help your business stay in line with internal policies, and I told you that's very important. It can also help you with government and, and industry compliance and things like that, meet those require those compliance requirements. And it can also help your business achieve accountability by consolidating your accounts, your access right permissions and all that into one centrally mo managed user identity, something that you can easily manage and easily find. And then I have this checklist that you can go back and look at later that talks about password cracking and some of the things you want to be familiar with. Go out and find out what brute force attacks are. I told you about dictionary attacks, not using dictionary words for your um, for your organization. Okay. Make sure that you have strong and safe passwords by going through this checklist uh, and making sure you're keeping them confidential. You know, you you creating long passwords. You know, not reusing passwords. Make sure that you have good pass password management. And one of the most important things for password management is making sure that you're educating your users and that you're enforcing those standards. I told you they have to be consequences, okay? That you're doing good auditing. All that is part of good ma password management. Use my checklist to make sure that you at least take a look at what you have in place. Managing and protecting your privileged accounts is essential to reducing risk and achieving compliance within your organization. And I hope that what I've given you today, these strategies, these, these ideas, these plans start you to at least think about what you can do to protect your own passwords. Now, it's time to make um, password management a priority in your organization. And what I want to do is I want to pass it over to my, my partner, Martin, and he's going to tell you how to do that and what they have in order to help you 
do this type of thing. So Martin, passing it on to you. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Let me just uh, find my right screen here. All righty. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can see my screen at the moment. I'm just going to get the presentation going. All right, so, uh, and actually, I mean, you just raised some really great points. And um, I mean, well, one of the key things that stands out for me is it's just like reuse of personal passwords and, um, you know, business passwords, you know, where, where people use the same ones. And, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of personal sites get hacked, um, you know, and that it just inevitably exposes, you know, what people are doing in the business world. And so, you know, if that that's obviously one thing that, that uh, you know, is very difficult to control. So, you know, the key thing about privilege account management um, you know, specifically password is, you know, making sure that they are regularly recycled. Um, users don't choose what the passwords are. And also, um, you know, as you'll see, you know, from my presentation, we don't expose them in the first place. So, I mean, password safe, you know, is the name would suggest does password management. I mean, it's, uh, you know, carbon based life forms need to be able to log on and say, yep, give me the password to X, Y, Z. Um, you know, you might have services, you know, Windows services, for example, or scheduled tasks that need to have, um, you know, a service account, um, you know, rotated, and then you might want to restart those services. Um, you may have applications and scripts, um, you know, that uh, have embedded credentials. I mean, you know, that the vast majority of them out there do. Um, so there's a full A to A capability, you know, to be able to remove those credentials. Um, we do SSH key management because uh, really you're just as strong as your weakest link. I mean, you know, you can do all the passive management in the world, um, but if you leave a vector unmanaged and uh, you have uh, SSH keys that give people access to critical systems, then, you know, that's something that someone's going to leverage. Um, but, you know, bottom line um, is session management. And uh, what you'll see is, you know, we include session management for free with the product for the simple reason um, as I just said, I mean, that the pest, uh, password management system is one where you never, ever release a password. You log the user onto those sessions. Now, in addition to that, we're able to record everything the user does, every click that they do, you know, right click on this, a left click on that. Every keystroke gets recorded, um, you know, and it's all indexed for searching. Um, we can do real-time alerting. Um, you can do over-the-shoulder session monitoring to see what people are doing. Um, if you see something nefarious, you know, you can then lock the sessions. Um, and we also got the ability to be able to, um, you know, to do automatic blocking and alerting. So if somebody runs a command they shouldn't, well, you know, maybe you automatically block the command or we just lock the entire session. Um, so how it works, and this actually, uh, this diagram got a little bit messed up in the uh, reformatting from uh, landscape to portrait, but uh, essentially, uh, you know, a user logs onto password safe and, you know, let's say they, they need access to, uh, you know, a, a credential in the security zone or an enclave. Um, password safe will then generate a unique one time session key. Um, and, uh, you know, that it gets sent down to the desktop um, and it automatically gets invoked um, to create an RDP or SSH session to the proxy. Now, at this point, um, nothing has come down to your desktop in terms of those privileged credentials. There's no username, there's no password, um, you know, that, that there's, uh, uh, you know, no host name even, I mean, has come down. So anybody sort of poking around, you know, using Mimikatz or, you know, other, you know, sort of sniffing tools aren't going to find anything of interest on that particular system where you logged on from. Everything is contained within that secure area. So, you know, the proxy is the one that makes that uh, secure internal connection. And, uh, you know, ultimately, you're just connected with that one-time key. So it's a very, very secure system as well. Now, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, it, it's not just the ability to say, yeah, we can get you onto the operating system and we can do video recording. That's great. But sometimes you want to be able to search for stuff, you know, tell me all the users that ran this application or tell me all the users that, you know, typed this command or saw this piece of activity. So, you know, we can, you know, not only just actually do the video recording, we index everything that's happened. And that's searchable not only within the session, session but right across the sessions as well. Um, you know, when it comes to the, the workflow, I mean, one of the key differentiators we have is something called adaptive workflow control. And that means, um, you know, quite simply that you've got a group of users, you've got a group of systems accounts that are under management, and you want to be able to apply an access policy. This means that you can actually control access based upon the time, 
um, you know, the day, even the date. So you've got a calendar in there where you can actually put in forward looking events, um, you know, where you're logging in from. So we can look at the IP address that you're coming in from to see are you authorized, obviously who you are and what you're trying to get. So the key thing is, is like, let's say, for example, you're a fire call admin, um, you know, you've got your, your duties during the day, you do, you know, your normal stuff. You've, you've got access to a certain range of accounts. You log in during the middle of the night and you're coming in via the VPN concentrator, maybe you, and you've got access to your fire call accounts. Um, you know, so it's, it's actually locking down what users can do. And this is especially true when it comes to remote vendors that need access to your environment. Lock them down if they're coming outside of the corporate network. Now, you know, it's not only, you know, the ability to be able to log on to operating systems, but we can launch applications securely as well. We can play in the credentials. So, you know, for example, you know, we can manage your vSphere credentials. We can log, um, you know, automatically launch your, um, your vSphere app, whether it's a FAT app, the Flex app, the HTML5 app, um, and, uh, you know, play in those credentials automatically. Log the user in and record everything that happens in the session. Um, any Unix Linux application, we can also launch. We can exec that command, um, play in the credentials, and, uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, allow the user to be able to perform certain tasks, which could be a menu-based system. It could be, um, you know, running scripts or you know, anything, you know, DBMS tool, um, you know, SQL Plus, for example. Um, the other big differentiator is, you know, what we do around reporting because, you know, ultimately, yeah, I mean, we've we got the full range of reports as you'd expect, like, you know, all of the tools in our space have, you know, the, the compliance reports, who did what, where and when. But then there's operational reports. How is it performing? You know, what do all your password changes look like? I mean, are there any particular bottlenecks? Um, you know, how are my rules being used? Um, you know, what are my users doing? You know, just globally. I mean, are, are people, um, you know, logging on to, are they getting passwords? You know, which could be like a, a misaligned security policy when they should be getting sessions. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the most important things as well, you know, from a reporting standpoint is giving you the security posture of your environment. Because very often when you put this sort of system in, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, until you actually scan your environment and you look for problems, yeah, you've got an idea of, yeah, we, you know, we need to lock it down or the auditors have said, yeah, okay, we've got to put a system in process. But, but what's the scale of it? And so our ability to be able to scan your environment and tell you exactly where all your low hanging fruit is, where all of your privileged accounts are, when was the password last changed? When was it last logged on to? Do you have any stale accounts that you know haven't been logged on to for two months, for example? These are all really sort of critical things to know ahead of time. And you can do all this even without managing a single account. Um, the you know advanced threat analytics is built into the product. It's not a separate charge. Um, Obviously, you know, the, the more Beyond Trust products you add, the more context you're going to get. Um, but you can even just do it, you know, with, with, with the past releases to understand, you know, look for anomalous events from anomalous places, you know, so it's really bubbling it up. We plug into SIMS, so this isn't trying to be a SIM, but what it does is it actually allows you to be able to provide some context and valuable context about, you know, where to look first or, you know, maybe you actually just want to be able to do some validation. So the key thing is, you know, as I say, adaptive workflow control, the scanning, um, there's a full data warehouse and analytics capability. We have these things called smart rules that allow you to be able to dynamically set policy, um, you know, across changing uh, elements in the environment. Um, everything is available. Everything you've seen here um, is available at no additional cost. I mean, it's all included in the price. And lastly, I mean, you know, it's, it's very easy to use. It's very clean and uncluttered. Um, and, it, and it's not just us, you know, blowing our own trumpet saying we're good. The analysts think we're, we're good as well. So um, feel free to take a look at the, you know, sort of Forrester Gartner guides. Um, you will see that we are rated, um, you know, it's obviously, you know, very top in, in terms of Forrester. And, uh, you know, in terms of Gartner, they don't actually sort of rank um, vendors. But you'll see that we are one of the most capable in terms of our um, uh, our portfolio. So very, very quick uh, product demonstration. I just want to actually run through, um, you know, just, just a couple of use cases just to show you how people use it. Um, you know, like most products, we have a web interface where people can go in and they can request access to systems. But what we also do is we allow you to be able to work with third-party tools. So, you know, mobile extern, I might want to be able to, you know, open up my SSH session. I might want to open up a, you know, RDP session as well. Um, you know, just to give an example, also in a Remote Desktop Connection Manager, you know, I can open up a session there. And the key thing is here is, 
what we're doing is we're actually providing um, the ability for you to take the tools to the users because ultimately, you know, very, very often what happens, oh, so it looks like I'm sort of logged in properly there, um, is that, uh, you know, very often a user can actually get into a situation where, you know, they'll stop using tools if they don't feel that those, uh, you know, tools are, you know, actually sort of not sort of, you know, unobtrusive if they're getting in their way. And, uh, you know, very often if people are used to using specific tools like Putty, MobX, Term Reflection, whatever, then, you know, they, they, they really don't like sort of moving to web interfaces to be able to, to, to log them. So by taking it out to the users, you know, into those tools makes it a lot easier. Um, you know, and I, you know, say one of the things we've also got the ability to be able to do is um, actually do like real time monitoring, you know, so we can actually look at active sessions that are happening. So the SSA session, we can take a look at everything that's happening on the screen. We can look over the shoulder. Um, we can lock the session, terminate the session. Um, exactly the same thing with, um, you know, RDP as well and applications. Um, I want to make sure that we've got enough time for Q&A. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got about four minutes left. So at this point, I mean, hopefully this has actually given you a taster of, uh, the, you know, the application itself and its ease of use. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, put it onto the poll, pass it back over to Sarah for uh, questions and answers. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, hey, you guys, so at this point, let's jump into our last poll. You should see that up on your screen. Would you be interested in, in engaging with one of our security experts further? We would love to chat or take you through a more thorough one-on-one -on -one demo of Power Broker Password Safe or any of our other privileged access management or vulnerability management solutions. So let us know, select yes, and let's leave this up. I'm gonna dive into a couple of questions that came in. Martin, this came in for you. So does Beyond Trust support website or account login similar to LastPass for the benefit of staff as well as privileged accounts for IT staff? So we actually have a, a product that does that. Um, it's due for release in November called Client Privilege Manager. Um, and it does exactly that behavior. It's an enterprise personal password management tool, not password management, but password storage um, that allows you to be able to uh, to store, you know, any of those accounts, uh, files, certificates, um, you know, for uh, which is going to be completely end user controlled. So, uh, yeah, there's a companion product to this that's actually coming out in November. Awesome, Derek. This one came in for you. Um, Bill Burr, author of the NIST publication, recently stated that there was no scientific basis for the recommendation of changing passwords every 90 days. And the NIST document has recently been rewritten recommending to drop the mandatory password change in favor of using longer passwords and keeping them for longer periods. Do you have any comments on this? And Derek, you might be on mute, so you might want to just check that and make sure you're, you're I'm not sorry, muted I was, right I now. was <laughs> no really on mute. I'm sorry about that. So, yes, I've heard about that. And my thing is this. I still think that – I agree with both. I think that the longer passwords are essential. I don't think they should have dropped the um, where we need to change them, even though they're longer passwords. Longer passwords are more difficult to break. However, it is still a good policy to change them every 30 days. Maybe you don't have to do it 30 days now. Maybe you have to do it every 90. So I think it needs to be a combination of both. Longer, stronger passwords and passphrases, along with some type of change um, schedule built into that. That's my thoughts on it. And maybe Martin has thoughts too. And Martin, I have another question for you that just came in. How does the Beyond Trust, how does Beyond Trust handle batch script embedded credentials? Uh, so we actually have an API uh, process, you know, integration that will actually deal with those. So, uh, you know, ideally, I mean, within batch scripts, um, you, you don't want to embed the credentials in the first place. You want to replace those with API calls. So we have a full REST API, um, you know, and also, I mean, you can do, uh, we have a shell scripting component that goes along with that, that allows you to be able to make those calls out dynamically um, within your batch scripts. Uh, but we also have tools, you know, that if you, if there are certain, you know, reasons like a, you know, sort of config file, um, you know, where, where you need to have some embedded credential, where you can also, you know, re replace that on schedule again through the API. But, uh, you know, either way, if you want to keep the credentials in there and rotate it, or if you want to replace the credentials on API core, we cover both use cases. Okay, guys, it's the top of the hour, so I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Um, the 60 minutes is up. I can't believe it. It always flies by. 
Um, a reminder that you will be receiving an email with a link to the recording and the slides shown here today within two business days from now, and it will come from communications at beyondtrust.com, so be on the lookout for that follow-up. And a huge thanks again to our experts, Derek and Martin. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Really appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you. Thanks for spending my birthday with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Happy birthday, Derek. I'm sorry I didn't sing happy birthday to you earlier. Um, but thank you, everybody who attended live as well. Have a great rest of your day. Take care, and we will see you at the next one. Goodbye, everybody.